And so what we're talking about today is the question they were asking is probably the most foundational question we could ask as a Messianic community. And that is, are the central claims of Messianic Judaism true? So we're going to be quoting a lot of material. We're going to be covering a lot of material. And we know we're going to be diving into some high-level stuff. And we're doing this because we know that everyone here can handle it, 13 to 30. And if you want to just listen along and, and watch, um, that's awesome. But if you really want to say, like, I want to see what he said there. I want to pause and I want to think about that. I want to see that again. Uh, just subscribe to our YouTube channel, Two Messianic Jews, so you can just rewatch any of the material that you missed or just want to get more in-depth on. And the link to the channel should be in the chat. So with that, um, I also just want to say before I present what, uh, what we're, we're, we're presenting, um, I want to say that we hold the views that we do based on the research that we've done, our study of Messianic Jewish history, the biblical data, our experience in the community, and the guiding principle that I strive to take in any discussion, especially one as essential as this, is pursuing truth is a greater goal than merely proving my point. And this goal just doesn't go for whether um, what Messianic Judaism is, what the claims that Messianic Judaism is making, but honestly, if, messi if the claims in Messianic Judaism are actually true. So I would love to hear your feedback on all the things that we're saying, because truth is actually what is most important. And with all that said, uh, let's, let's get right into this. The three central claims of Messianic Judaism are, one, Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. Two, Jewish followers of Yeshua have a covenantal responsibility to live as Jews. In other words, observe Torah to preserve Israel's distinct identity among the nations. And by covenantal responsibility, that term that I'm using, what that means is in the way Rabbi Russ Resnick says, he says to live as members of a people chosen by God and given in scripture, a unique set of instructions and obligations to live in a way that contributes to the survival and destiny of the Jewish people. So that's what I mean by covenantal responsibility. And the third point is the third major claim that Messianic Judaism makes is participating in Jewish worship in ways of life is a legitimate option for Gentile followers of Yeshua. So before I go further, I just want to keep in mind that the second point that I, I'm covering right there, the second point that we're presenting, is not accepted by everyone in the Messianic movement, and we're not claiming to represent the YMJ's view on this necessarily, but I just want to say that up front before I just go further in the discussion, so everyone's aware of that. Okay, so... The first claim, I'm going to cover the first claim on whether Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. What reasons do we have to believe that is true? And Eric's going to cover the second and third claim. So we'll have a short Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask for clarification or really just ones you're curious about related to what we're discussing. And if we don't have time to answer your question, if we run out of time, uh, you can message us on Instagram or Facebook at 2 Messianic Jews with the number 2 Messianic Jews. You could also email us at 2 Messianic Jews at gmail.com. That's T W O, Messianic Jews at gmail.com. Okay, so great. And as I was saying, so pursuing truth is essential. And I just want you to ask yourselves no one has, you don't have to put this in the chat, but just ask yourself this question How do I know that Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah? How do you know Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah? And that's a question I've, I've really had to wrestle with for a long time. And early on, when I was questioning whether my faith in Yeshua was actually true, I, I reasoned through an argument that I heard from a prominent Christian apologist. And that is this. If Yeshua claimed to be the Messiah, and he said that he would prove this claim by his death and resurrection, then his resurrection would be the evidence that his claim was actually true. If he rose from the dead, then yes, Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. And for several years, uh, starting in, I think, 2014, I started presenting this evidence to these, th this argument uh, to the YMJ Messiah Conference. This past Messiah Conference last year, I, I spoke to the MJA on really just looking at the historical evidence for the resurrection of Yeshua. But that argument I was discussing of, of if Yeshua claimed to be the Messiah, he said he's going to die and rise from the dead, and the resurrection would therefore prove that his claim was true, um, I started having discussions with a really intelligent Jewish graduate student, a PhD student. And through much of the discussion, I, I was really presenting this to him and seeing how, how he would respond. Really just, it was friendly. It was a great conversation. Um, but we, we, had, we had differences. And he actually convinced me that this is not a compelling argument for a religious Jewish person. He said something was missing. It wasn't compelling to him. And he, I don't think he convinced me that 
really, it's going to be difficult um, to convince a religious Jew to accept this argument. And I, I took that seriously because, honestly, pursuing truth is what is most important. And I really want to understand where people are coming from and what would be convincing to them and, and to others. And should I be convinced of this argument? And so m- even more on this, um, at Maasai Conference uh, for a number of years, um, what Eric and I love to do, one of our I mean, at least I'll speak for myself, at least my favorite part of going to Messiah conference or one of my favorite parts is going down to the Jews for Judaism tent at the entrance to Messiah college. I don't know if any of you uh, seen those guys, but basically there's these counter missionaries, which they're basically there to uh, bring Messianic Jews out of Messianic Judaism to embrace their faith, Orthodox Judaism. Um, They're just trying to what they think is deconvert you from uh, your belief in Yeshua. And that's very intimidating for most people, but um, I think it's just an amazing opportunity to go test out what I believe, to have great conversations with them and just pursuing truth and just seeing, you know, what will my, the arguments that I say of why I believe what I believe is true stand against the toughest scrutiny. And one year um, I was talking to an Orthodox rabbi and counter missionary and talking about the historical evidence for the resurrection of Yeshua. And he said something that really stood out to me. He said that, even if he was convinced that Yeshua rose from the dead, even if Yeshua was standing right in front of him, he would not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. Why? Because in Deuteronomy 13, what Deuteronomy 13 shows us is that even false prophets can perform miracles. So the resurrection would be just a test from God to see whether we as a Jew or or him as a Jew would remain faithful to God rather than worshiping a false Messiah. That's what he said. And I I took what this rabbi said seriously, and I did my best to understand where he was coming from. And after carefully investigating this claim that he was making over the past couple years, testing out my arguments with Messianic Jews, Christians, Jews from the wider Jewish community, even counter missionaries, I'm convinced that really the opposite of what that rabbi said is true. The resurrection is evidence for Yeshua's Messiahship because of Deuteronomy 13. Now, what, what do I mean by this? Well, I think we should hear something from the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, who's considered by many, many Jews to be just the most incredible Jewish thinker in all of history. Um, And what he said is this, you should listen to the truth, whoever may have said it. I think he's right. Truth can come out of the mouth of anyone. Anyone's capable of producing the truth. We can find truth from even those who we radically disagree with. And Maimonides, on a number of things, as Messianic Jews, we we agree with him on some, we agree, we disagree with him on others. One of these things that we disagree with him on is Maimonides argued that Yeshua falsely claimed to be the Messiah, that he attempted to abolish the Torah and was justifiably executed as a false prophet and he never rose from the dead. That's Maimonides' view. But this brilliant Jewish thinker actually gives us the best reasons to believe that Yeshua's resurrection would be evidence that he is in fact the Jewish Messiah. If Yeshua rose from the dead, which I don't have time to get into the historical evidence. You can ask in the Q&A if you'd like, but he actually gives us the best reasons to believe that if Yeshua rose from the dead, then that means he is in fact the Jewish Messiah. So given Maimonides' reading and exposition of Deuteronomy 13, if Yeshua rose from the dead, this would be God's validation of Yeshua's messianic identity and the pronouncement that Yeshua taught Israel to remain faithfully committed to Torah observance. So, what, how, do, how am I going to get to here? I mean, that's, that's a lot that I'm claiming there. So let's, let's get right into this. So we're going to start by reading Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 1. You could see it uh, in the chat. In verse 1, it says this, If there should stand up in your midst a prophet or a dreamer of a dream, and he will produce to you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes about of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us follow of other gods you did not know, and we will worship them. Do not hearken to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer of a dream, For Hashem, your God, is testing you to know whether you love Hashem, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. Hashem, your God, shall you follow, and him you shall fear. His commandments shall you observe, and to his voice you shall hearken. Him shall you serve, and to him you shall cleave. And that prophet and that dreamer of a dream shall be put to death. For he had spoken perversion against Hashem, your God. So one question one question I want to ask the primary text here is why would a false prophet perform a sign or wonder? Like why, why would they do that? Well, I think the answer lies in the fact that this is how God validates true prophets. So 
Look in Exodus 14.31. In Exodus 14.31, it says, Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So this, this verse is talking about after the children of Israel crossed through the Red Sea on dry land, and the Egyptians are coming after them, and the sea collapses, destroying the Egyptians. The, Israel, the, the, the Israelites are delivered from the, from the land of Egypt, from, from slavery. And they say, this is why we believe that Moses is a prophet sent by God, because we've seen the great work the Lord did through Moses, and we believe in the Lord. In Deuteronomy 34, another example, in Deuteronomy 34, verse 10 through 12, this is the stone edition. Um, this is what it says. Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom Hashem had known face to face, as evidenced by all the signs and wonders that Hashem sent him to perform in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his courtiers, in all his land, and by all the strong hand and awesome power that Moses performed before the eyes of all Israel. So the evidence that Moses was a true prophet sent by God is, quote, all the signs and wonders that Hashem sent him to perform. And there are many other examples in the Tanakh revealing that God validates true prophets through signs and wonders. And this really helps us understand why a false prophet would perform signs and wonders in Deuteronomy 13. Because if God validates true prophets through signs and wonders, then what this false prophet is trying to do is to emulate the real thing. He's trying to mimic the real thing. And that's, that's what we see. But this raises another question, right? How can Israel distinguish between a true prophet and a false prophet if they're both producing miracles? That's a problem, and that's, and that's a question um, I think we should address. And this is actually where I'm going to start talking about Maimonides. So Maimonides is, 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 is just brilliant here. This is what he says in his letter to Yemen. We are enjoined to yield obedience to one who asserts that he is a prophet, provided he can substantiate his claims by miracle or proofs, although there is a possibility that he is an imposter. However, if the would-be prophet teaches tenets that negate the doctrines of Moses, then we must repudiate him. Right? So here we see that Maimonides says we're supposed to obey a prophet if he can provide a miracle to prove that his claim is true. But there's a possibility that the, this prophet is teaching against the doctrines of Moses. He's teaching against Torah. And so what do we do there? Well, we read on in another um, work that Maimonides finished. It's called Mishnah Torah. And Mishnah Torah, he says this. If a prophet bids us worship idols, even on a single occasion, we are not to listen to him. And though he performs great signs and wonders, if he says that the Almighty commanded him that an idol should be worshipped this day and only this hour only, since he seeks to discredit the teachings of Moses, we know for certain that he is a false prophet, and whatever he did was done by secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft. Okay, this is good. So according to Maimonides, the key to knowing whether one is a true prophet or a false prophet is by judging whether the miracle they provide actually comes from the power of God. And so one way to know this, one way to know whether their miracle came from the power of God is by testing what they teach. If he's teaching against the Torah, then that means that whatever miracle they perform was done with secret arts and with the aid of witchcraft, meaning a power other than God. So in, in order to know whether one is a true prophet, the requirement is that they provide a miracle and that that miracle comes through the power of God. That, that's the key to this argument. And I think my mind is right up here. I, I really do. Because his reading of Deuteronomy 13 and his explanation of how to identify true and false prophets helps us understand the biblical data. So, for example, in 1 Kings 18, this is where Elijah attempts to show Israel that, that he is a true prophet and that the God of Israel is the true and one God. And he does this on Mount Carmel. So on Mount Carmel, Elijah challenges the 450 prophets of Baal to put a bull on an altar of their choice and to place wood under it. He says, quote, you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. So these 450 prophets, they all call on the name of their God for hours and th there's no answer. Um, Elijah starts to, to mock them actually at some point. Uh, but what, what goes on here? is when it's Elijah's turn, he goes and he builds an altar. He puts the wood, he puts a stone altar, the wood on it, the, the offering, and then he builds a trench around, around the, the, the offering, the altar. And he says that 
he pours water on it and it fills the trench and all, all this is happening because he really wants to show that the God of Israel is the true God and he is a true prophet. And he and in his prayer to God, he says he wants this to happen. He wants God to answer his call to bring fire from heaven so that they may know that you are God, quote, that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that it is by your word that I've done all these things. So, as a result, fire falls from heaven. It consumes not only the offering, but the wood, the stones, and the earth. It licked up the water in the trench. And at the sight of this, all the people fall on their faces, and they declare, and they declare, Hashem, He is God. Hashem, He is God. So, consistent with Deuteronomy 13, Elijah provides a sign to justify his status as a true prophet and to bring Israel back to the worship of the true God. And the rabbi's perspective on this account is really fascinating as it relates. And what what it says in in Babylonian Talmud, Berkot 6b, it says, The first answer me, Elijah asked God to answer me, answer me. And, and And they say, the first answer me was the request that fire descend from the heavens. While the second answer me was the request that Israel should accept complete faith in God and not say that the fire descending from the heavens was an act of sorcery. So we see here this this idea of an act of sorcery, right? The explanation is consistent with Maimonides' understanding of Deuteronomy 13. God validates Elijah as a true prophet by providing the miraculous sign, fire from heaven. And so what the Tanakh and Jewish tradition reveals is that if a person claims to be a prophet and God is the source of the power for their miracle, then Israel is commanded to recognize that person as a true prophet. So with all that said, with all that background, let's look at the New Testament. So in Matthew chapter 12, when Yeshua, when Yeshua heals a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and the crowds ask, can this be the son of David? They're, they're wondering, can this be the Messiah to claim to be the son of David? That was what they were saying is, is this the Messiah of Israel? And the text continues in verse 24, where it says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons, that this fellow casts out demons. So here, the Pharisees are not questioning whether Yeshua actually performed healing miracles, whether he actually exercised a demon. What they're doing is they're countering the curiosity of the crowd that Yeshua might be the Messiah. By asserting that the source of Yeshua's miracles are not from God, they're from Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So God validates true prophets through miracles, but the miracles of false prophets come from other sources. And in this case, it's what the Pharisees are talking about, Beelzebub. And the concern of identifying the source of the power of a miracle is also found in Second Temple Judaism, the Judaism of the time period of Yeshua. And in the first century, the first century Jewish historian Josephus, he writes a rewritten biblical account of Moses and the Egyptian priests. And he's describing the situation where Moses is about to turn his rod into a serpent, but he's explaining to Pharaoh why his miracle, he explained to the Egyptians why his, why his miracle is meaningful. And this is what he says. O king, I do not myself despise the wisdom of the Egyptians, but I say that what I do is so much superior to what these do by magic arts and tricks, as divine power exceeds the power of man. But I will demonstrate that it, that what I do is not done by craft or counterfeiting what is really not true, what is not really true, but that they appear by the providence and power of God. So here, Josephus emphasizes how his miraculous signs are done through God's power, and the Egyptian priests are only, quote, counterfeiting what is really not true. And this is significant because it relates to Deuteronomy 13, because the only signs and wonders that vindicate and validate true prophets are those done through God's power. It's a question of miracle versus magic, and the answer lies in the source of the power behind the miracle being provided. So, the Second Temple Jewish context helps us understand why Yeshua responds the way he does. Yeshua makes an argument for why his exorcisms are done through God's power, but this is this does not satisfy some of the Pharisees. So, some of the Pharisees and the scribes continue in verse 38, saying to Yeshua, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now, he could have been like, well, I just exercised a demon, right? I just, I just did that. Was, that. was that not enough? Did I just show you that it came from the power of God? No, he, he actually goes further, and he, it's a very interesting response. But before I give that response, I just want to make note here that Jewish scholar Aaron Gale, and who's writing the, uh, the comments in the Jewish Annotate New Testament on Matthew, he points out that what, Yeshua, what the Pharisees are asking Yeshua is to prove with a sign that he is, in fact, the Messiah. 
So here we get Yeshua answering the question of how do we know you're the Messiah? What sign are you going to provide? And Yeshua says this, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. So what he's saying here is that the sign to prove his identity as the Messiah his, will be comparable to the experience of Jonah in the belly of the fish. Specifically, it tells us that in the, in the Gospels, what it tells us is that he's referring to him being killed and shortly thereafter rising from the dead. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's going to be dead and he's going to rise from the dead. Now, the Sanhedrin did not accept Yeshua as the Messiah. These leaders, they did not, our Jewish leaders did not accept Yeshua as the Messiah. And in Mark 14, verse 61 through 62, this recounts Yeshua's trial. It says this, Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Yeshua said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, I don't have time to get into much detail but um, on this passage, but the point is that Yeshua's response here is one, he affirms that he's the Messiah, and two, he claims to be the one who's seated at the right hand of God, quoting Psalm 110 verse 1, and he'll become riding on the clouds of heaven, quoting Daniel 7 13. And Orthodox Jewish scholar Daniel Boyarin, he makes a great point here. He points out that in the Tanakh, it is God who is the one who comes riding on the clouds of heaven. And when Yeshua says, I am, or ego e me in Greek, He's saying he's echoing back to Exodus 3.14, where God presents himself to Moses as I am. So Boyarn puts it this way. He says, the high priest of the Jews could hardly be expected to miss this illusion. Jesus claims to be the son of man and indeed God himself. A statement such as that is not merely true or false. It is truth or blasphemy. And this interpretation is consistent with how the high priest respond, right? In the high priest responds in Mark 14, verse 63 through 64, as uh, that he tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him, deserving of death. So the Sanhedrin reject Yeshua's claim as the Messiah, and they rule that he should be executed as a false prophet. So through the available means, they send Yeshua to Pontius Pilate, and as a result, he's executed, he's crucified. So what happens here is through the means that were available at the time, they were able to fulfill their duty of executing Yeshua as a false prophet, sending him to Rome. Rome executed him, but this is the best way they could do it, fulfilling the role of judging him as a false prophet according to Deuteronomy 13. Now, Maimonides says Israel must obey a prophet provided they can provide a sign or wonder from the power of God. Now, the sign Yeshua prophesied to prove his messianic identity is his resurrection from the dead. And in Judaism, we know that the resurrection, resurrection is only something that God has the power to do. And that's key. So for example, the Jerusalem Talmud explains this principle really clearly. It says, only the Holy One prays to him can resurrect the dead. As it is written, the eternal kills and gives life, brings down to the pit and lifts up. Quoting from 1 Samuel 2 verse 6. Another clear expression of this Jewish belief in the resurrection of the dead is found in the Amidah where it declares, you are mighty forever, O Lord, you revive the dead. And then, then it raises the question, who is like you, master of mighty deeds? Who can be compared to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and causes salvation to sprout? You are faithful to restore the dead to life. Blessed are you, O Lord, who brings life to the dead. So here, the prayer asks the question, if anyone can be compared to God, meaning who else can raise the dead? And the answer is, there's none other. As Jeremiah 10.6 says, There is none like you, O Hashem. You are great, and your name is great in might. So, throughout Jewish history, Jewish thinkers have continually echoed this powerful Amidah prayer, declaring God's exclusive power to raise the dead to life. So, as Maimonides has shown us, the key to knowing whether one is a true prophet or a false prophet is by determining whether the miracle they provide actually comes from the power of God. As Jewish thinkers like Ibn Ezra, Rabbi Jacob Ben Asher, and Dr. Jeffrey Tigay, they point out that God tests Israel. It's a test, right? God tests Israel by allowing the false prophet to perform a sign or wonder. This is different, but keep in mind, this is different than God being the source of their power. So, 
God may allow a false prophet to perform a sign or wonder, but that is only to test Israel's faithfulness to him, but God is not the power behind their miracles. And that's the key between God being the source of the power and not being, allowing it to happen. So God allows these miracles to take place rather than being the source of power itself. So in line with this reasoning, the Babylonian Talmud records Rabbi Akiva's stance on this issue. And this is what he says, whether God would back up the claims of a false prophet by providing a miracle. Akiva says this, Heaven forbid that the Holy One, blessed be he, would stop the sun for those who violate his will. A false prophet could never perform an actual miracle. God wouldn't do it. God would not back up the claims of a false prophet by providing miraculous signs. And so here, let's, I'm just going to summarize here. Yeshua claims that the sign to prove that he was Israel's Messiah would be his resurrection from the dead shortly after his execution. The Sanhedrin considered Yeshua's messianic claim to be, to be blasphemous, and they sent him to be crucified by Rome. So if the signs and wonders Yeshua produced while he was alive was a test for Israel, once he was killed, the test was over, right? A dead false prophet can't raise himself. He can't, he can't, he can't do that. So as seen in the Tanakh and rabbinic literature, only God has the power to raise the dead. God wouldn't validate the claims of a false prophet. So we ask the question, is Yeshua the Jewish Messiah? Yes, because it was God who raised Yeshua from the dead. That is the validation of Yeshua's messianic claims. His messianic claims were in fact true. Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. So yes, there are more prophecies for Yeshua to fulfill in his messianic role. And Yeshua's resurrection is God's revelation to Israel that he will fulfill those prophecies when he returns. So understanding Yeshua's resurrection in light of how Maimonides reads Deuteronomy 13 also addresses the primary reason why a religious Jew rejects Yeshua as the Messiah. And that is the dominant Christian view that Yeshua freed Jews from having to keep the commandments. Eric and I, uh, back in 2017, we hosted a debate between Rabbi Daniel Freitag, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and Dr. Michael Brown. And this was my, uh, Rabbi Freitag's major number one primary objection to believing that Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah. And I'm going to quote him right here. This is what he says. All I need is for there to be one place in this book, speaking of the Bible, the, the Torah and the Tanakh. He says, all I need is for there to be one place in this book, one, just once, anywhere, first person statement to me from God that says this, dear Jew, I changed my mind. No longer shall you keep the commandments, for the Messiah will come, and through his death, you will no longer need to keep the commandments. In this debate, this was Rabbi Freitag, again, this was his primary objection to Yeshua being the Messiah. A Messiah who frees the Jews from the responsibility to follow the Torah is no Messiah at all. If this is, the, if this is what Yeshua taught, then I think Rabbi Freitag is right. Yeshua is not the Messiah. He's a false prophet according to Deuteronomy 13, right? But what God raising Yeshua from the dead shows us is that Yeshua did not contradict the Torah. It shows us that Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah who taught Israel to remain faithfully committed to Torah observance. Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah because Yeshua rose from the dead. Now, if you're interested in looking further into this argument, um, I just actually got an, an article published in Kesher, a journal for Messianic Judaism. It should be out um, either this month or next month, and it's called The Resurrection of Jesus, Another Jewish Perspective. So you can keep an eye on that, or you could also, and you could also uh, follow us on our YouTube channel where Eric and I will be discussing this stuff uh, for further. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Eric, who's going to go over the next two primary claims that Messianic Judaism makes. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I know Jonathan just dumped a whole lot of awesome content on you. So just as a reminder, we will be posting this recording on the Two Messianic Jews YouTube channel. So if you want to listen again, go subscribe uh, in order to be notified when it is posted. I think the link is in the chat. And I also want to reiterate uh, what Jonathan shared at the beginning. We are presenting a case for what we currently view as the three central claims of Messianic Judaism. These are conclusions and reasons we have come through our research thus far, but we are always open to hearing new perspectives and we are willing to change our minds. At the end of the day, we would rather discover truth than merely prove our point. So though I arrived at a view that I am confident in sharing with you, I intend for this to be part of an ongoing conversation and I'm always open to new information. 
So thank you for taking the time to hear us out and consider our perspective. Uh, we really look forward to your feedback. So to jump right in, there is essentially 1,800 years of Christian theology saying uh, the central claims of Messianic Judaism are undesirable at best or even a sin at worst. And kind of just the bulk of that information uh, at one point in my life really sent me on a journey that I guess caused me to arrive where I am today. Uh, but what I discovered is that luckily, since the Holocaust, we are seeing a dramatic shift in New Testament scholarship toward Jewish friendly readings of the Gospels and Paul and the rest of the New Testament. So we as Messianics, we often have to deal with pointed questions, skeptical looks, and sometimes personal insecurity when it comes to our way of life because those 1800 years worth of objections don't just go away overnight. So I hope I can give you all some good material to help you with these things today. So I will do my best to support the remaining two claims Jonathan and I are making in this presentation. And these claims are that our second claim is that Jewish followers of Yeshua have a covenantal responsibility to live as Jews, in other words, observe Torah, to preserve Israel's distinct identity among the nations. And then our third claim, participating in Jewish worship and ways of life is a legitimate option for Gentile followers of Yeshua. And then at the end, uh, as long as we have time, I will discuss the theological significance of Jews and Gentiles worshiping the God of Israel alongside one another. All right, so first I will start uh, with exploring our second claim, which can also be stated in this way. Contributing to the preservation of Israel by living out our Jewish identity is indispensable and is crucial for bringing glory to God and magnifying his kingdom as brought by the resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah. So is this true? Do the scriptures teach that Jewish followers of Yeshua continue to have the responsibility to live a life directed by the teachings of the Torah? So I think this question can be answered in the affirmative if we are able to demonstrate the truth of the following two claims. And that is one, that the Tanakh teaches that all Jewish people across space and time are expected by God to observe Torah by virtue of being Jewish in order to preserve the nation of Israel. Then claim number two, the New Testament teaches Jewish people remain Jewish after accepting Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel. So if these are both true, then Jewish followers of Yeshua are expected by God to observe the Torah. So let's look at the evidence for claim number one. And we will not come close to covering it all because that would essentially require reading every word of the Tanakh because this is pretty much what it is all about. But I will highlight some key verses that I think bring to light some important uh, notions. But first, I want to give a note on ancient civilizations. In the ancient world, there was no distinction between ethnic, political, and religious identity like there is today. These were all wrapped up in an individual's national identity. Jewish scholar Dr. Paula Fredrickson describes it in this way. Ethnic distinctiveness and religious distinctiveness are simple synonyms and native to all ancient peoples. What we call religion was seen as an innate, not a detachable aspect of identity. Elsewhere, she also puts it like this. There is no such thing as a non-religious ethnic group in antiquity. All ethnicities had their gods and their pantheons and their customs and their holidays. Essentially, being part of a nation, by definition, puts you underneath a God and a way of life of which to follow that God. And this is what I think I see in Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 26. So Exodus 19, 3 through 6 says, Moses went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain, saying, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell B'nai Yisrael, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to B'nai Yisrael. So then God proceeds to give Moses the Ten Commandments and then the entire Torah. In this passage from chapter 19, we see that observing Torah is wrapped tightly around being God's chosen nation of Israel. There was no ethnic and religious distinction. Being Israel and observing the Torah go hand in hand. 
And just a side note, I think Exodus 19 is a beautiful illustration of salvation through grace in the Tanakh. God saves Israel from slavery in Egypt before the Torah was even given. How can people say there is a conflict between grace and Torah? The gift of the Torah was only given after Israel was already brought to God out of slavery by his power alone. And as we see, God expects Israel to keep the Torah as a demonstration of faithfulness in response to the grace they were already granted. And so I think just another indication of this kind of relationship between being Israel and observing the Torah is found in Deuteronomy 26, 16 through 18, which says, And the Lord has declared that you are a people for his treasured possession, as he promised you, and that you are to keep his commandments. You shall be a people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. So again, it just appears, at least to me, that there is an inseparable link between being Israel and observing the Torah. God expected Israel to observe his commandments by virtue of Israel being his nation. Our being God's holy nation, prepared to bless the entire world, and being obedient to the Torah go hand in hand. Sometimes people object to Torah observance by saying, Oh, the Torah was only meant to be observed in the land of Israel. And so obviously, if this is true, this would be a major downer on Messianic Judaism outside of Israel. But I think Deuteronomy 30 directly refutes this objection and shows that God expected Israel to observe Torah even outside the land of Israel. So Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 3, says this. Now, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse that I have set before you, and you take them to heart in all the nations where Adonai your God has banished you, you and you return to Adonai your God and listen to his voice according to all that I am commanding you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, then Adonai your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you, and he will, and he will return and gather you from all the peoples where Adonai your God has scattered you. So here it says Israel is to observe Torah even in exile. He expected them to observe the Torah across all of space, uh, you know, no matter where they are on the earth. So this also shows that keeping Torah is a crucial way God preserves Israel and the Jewish people as a distinct nation. When the Jewish people were exiled from the land, the land could no longer function as an identity marker and identity preserver. We had to rely on our scriptures and communal traditions and practices to preserve Israel as a nation. And so this concept may sound familiar if you went to Rebecca's and Shauna's teaching on Zionism earlier this week. And so, again, I think we gain some further perspective in regards to time in the prophet Ezekiel. Here are some important verses from Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28. For I will take you from the nations gather you out of all the countries, and bring you back to your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean from all the uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my ruach within you. Then I will cause you to walk in my laws, so you will keep my rulings and do them. Then you will live in the land that I give to your fathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. So this is another crucial development. Ezekiel envisioned a future time when we are brought back from exile, and our sin and idolatry are forgiven, and we are given a new heart, and we receive the Ruach. This should sound familiar to us. Uh, we will not only be expected, but enabled to walk according to God's laws. And again, as shown in verse 28, this is a vital way in which God preserves us as his chosen people. In Ezekiel's vision of the future, so across time, being Israel and observing Torah still go hand in hand. And so when I read these passages, I come to this conclusion. Israel is God's chosen people, and by virtue of being Israel, we are expected to observe the Torah. This is not only to be guided in moral and civil living, or to be a demonstration of, gratitu of gratitude for the reception of God's grace and faithfulness to his covenant, but also, as we will continue to explore, in order to preserve the nation of Israel as a distinct nation, in order to magnify God's glory and the power of Messiah Yeshua. All right, 
So hopefully at this point, I have provided enough evidence to support my first point that the Tanakh teaches that all Jewish people across space and time are expected by God to observe Torah to preserve the nation of Israel. So now my second point is that the New Testament teaches that Jewish people remain Jewish after accepting Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel. Remember, if I'm able to show that this claim is true, it indicates that the second central claim of Messianic Judaism is true, that Jewish followers of Yeshua continue to have a covenantal responsibility to live as Jews in order to preserve the nation of Israel. And so for this, I think all we have to do is show one thing, that the New Testament refers to some followers of Yeshua as Jewish. And if this is true, that Jews remain Jews after becoming followers of Yeshua, then we can conclude they remained expected to observe the Torah, because as we just saw, being a faithful Jew meant being Torah observant by definition. So then the second claim of Messianic Judaism would be shown to be true. All right, so for this, I think Paul provides many examples of Jewish identity continuing after becoming a follower of Yeshua, and this is him personally. So first, in Romans 11.1, 1, Paul says, For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Then in 2 Corinthians 11.22, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. And then in Acts 21.39, he is very succinct, and he says, I am a Jew. So, if following Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel entailed a removal of Torah observance, we should expect a removal of Jewish identity, because Jewish identity implies an expectation of Torah observance. Clearly, Paul did not see Jewish identity as being removed. Therefore, this implies he did not see the expectation of Jewish Torah observance to be erased. That said, even with this case, it is worth exploring if the New Testament says anything more explicit about Jewish followers of Yeshua and Torah observance. And for that, let's start with 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 18. It says, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, let him walk in this way. I give this rule in all of Messiah's communities. Was anyone called when he had already been circumcised? Let him not make himself uncircumcised. Has anyone been called while uncircumcised? Let him not allow himself to be circumcised. Okay, so here Paul is affirming that he not only views himself, but other Jewish followers of Yeshua as still being Jewish, and Gentile followers of Yeshua still being Gentiles. Does Paul provide any indication what this means for Torah observance? I think he does in Galatians 5, 2 through 3. And here Paul says, Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, so he's speaking to Gentiles, Messiah will be of no benefit to you. Again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to keep the whole Torah. All right. So first, it's important to explain that circumcision at that time was neither a single isolated commandment of which to observe or simply a mark of conversion to the religion of Judaism. It was a mark of changing one's national identity from non-Jewish to Jewish. So if these Gentiles became Jews, not only would they lose the benefits of Messiah, but they would be obligated to observe the whole law. What does this imply? This implies that Jews are obligated to observe the whole law. But this also implies that Gentiles are obligated to observe parts of the law. What is the difference? In Torah, there are things that God holds the entire world responsible to, such as avoiding idolatry, marital ethics, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And then there are things he only commands to Jews and holds them responsible to, such as kosher law, Shabbat observance, the feasts, stuff like that. So if these Gentiles were to change their national identity and become Jews, they would then be obligated to observe these things. So does this mean Gentiles cannot choose to observe things that Jews are obligated to observe, like kosher or Shabbat? No. Gentiles can certainly choose to engage in these practices and receive understanding, refreshment, and newfound love for the scriptures, the Jewish people, and Yeshua from them. Participating in Jewish worship and ways of life is not the same as changing your identity from non-Jewish to Jewish in order to receive the benefits of Messiah. 
but more on that later on. But my point here is this. Galatians 5.3 makes clear that Paul did expect Jewish followers of Yeshua to continue to observe the Torah. And Paul, he not only talks the talk, but he also walks the walk. And the next passage I'm about to read should probably be the first place you go whenever it comes to showing the New Testament supports this claim of Messianic Judaism. And this passage is Acts 21, 20 through 24. And it says this, James and the elders said to Paul, You see, brother, how many myriads there are among the Jewish people who have believed, and they are all zealous for the Torah. They have been told about you, that you teach all the Jewish people among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. What's to be done then? No doubt they will hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who have a vow on themselves. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses, so that they may shave their heads. That way all will realize there is nothing to the things they have been told about you, but that you yourself walk in an orderly manner, keeping the Torah. So I remember back when I came to faith in 2013, I was 17 years old, and soon after, I was filled with doubts about my messianic identity. But then I read this passage, and I was just blown away. The question about whether Jewish followers of Yeshua observe Torah is shown explicitly. Paul was being accused of teaching against Torah, and the leadership in, 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 and the leadership in Jerusalem was like, Look, we know this isn't true, but do this public display of serious Torah observance to show everyone that this isn't true. And I knew actions spoke louder than words, and that Paul's actions and acts should guide our interpretation of Paul's words, especially if you believe it is all God's scripture. But don't think Christian theologians just swiped this passage under the rug. They do attempt to deal with this passage, and unfortunately, I don't have time to address it now, but there's the teaser for it if you want to ask during the Q&A. Uh, hopefully we have time for that. All right, so hopefully by this point, I have shared sufficient evidence that the New Testament affirms the continuation of Jewish identity for Jewish followers of Yeshua, and that this Jewish identity entails a covenantal responsibility to observe the Torah in order to preserve the nation of Israel. All right, so now to the third and final claim. Participation in Jewish worship and ways of life is a legitimate option for Gentile followers of Yeshua. So to start, at the time the New Testament was being written, in the second half of the first century AD, there was no other option besides the synagogue for Gentile followers of Yeshua. Church buildings as institutions wholly separate from Jewish ways of worship were not yet a thing. This is often a surprise because if we read like the ESV translation, for example, we see church written all throughout it. So we read the word church, and then we import our image into the text of a modern-day church building with a steeple and a cross on top, and we consciously or unconsciously think that in the first century there were pagans in their temples, Jews in their synagogues, and Christians in their churches. But in reality, this was not the case. The word typically translated as church is the Greek word ekklesia, but scholars have found it had a variety of meanings and that church is not nearly the best translation of the term when reading the New Testament. Dr. Anders Runsen says this, A term that has often been mistranslated as church is ekklesia. Ekklesia simply means assembly, but ekklesia was also used by the Jews as a synagogue term both for public synagogues and association synagogues. This means, among other things, that when ecclesia is used in New Testament texts to designate a community of Christ believers, we cannot draw the conclusion that they had divorced themselves from the synagogue or from Judaism, as many scholars have mistakenly argued. It was not until later that the term ecclesia came to be used exclusively for what we call church today. So in reality, there were the various pagan temples, some pagan philosophical schools, and then the synagogue. The building of churches as Christian institutions wholly separate from Jewish ways of worship came much later. But I just want to be very clear that this does not mean 
all Gentile followers of Yeshua should all be in a Messianic synagogue. This does not mean all Christians should be leaving the church. There are many fantastic churches that are great at discipleship and are friends of the Jewish people. And even in exceptional cases, these churches are often the best place even for Messianic Jews. So the synagogue being the only option means that it was only natural for Gentile followers of Yeshua to participate in the synagogue. These were the only places exclusively worshiping the God of Israel, reading from the Jewish scriptures, and seeking to live lives as approved by the one true God. And this brings whole new light to passages such as Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8-10. through 10. Now it's possible to recognize that these are discussions on how Paul would like his Gentile readers to understand kosher law in Romans 14 and how to practice it when being a guest in other people's homes, such as in 1 Corinthians 8-10. through 10. So I think this is one of the cases where we can say, if it was good then, it is good now. Participation in Jewish ways of worship and ways of life is a legitimate option for Gentile followers of Yeshua. So if participating in synagogue life was the natural place for Gentile followers of Yeshua at this time, why are there all those difficult passages in Paul that seemingly denigrate the Torah? Paul was attempting to navigate a very precise position. He believed Jews and Gentiles had equal status before the God of Israel by virtue of faith in Yeshua the Messiah, and he also believed national distinctions between Israel and the nations remained. So he may have been bringing Gentiles into the synagogue to worship the Messiah in Jewish ways, but he had to be careful these Gentiles did not feel like they had to become Jews to do so. Why is this? I think it is because he recognized how valuable their Gentile identity is to the kingdom of God. I think Romans 15, 7 through 12 gives us insight into this solution. These passages says, this passage says, Therefore, accept one another, just as Messiah also accepted you, to the glory of God. For I declare that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcised for the sake of God's truth, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. For this reason I will give you praise among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. And again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise Adonai, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a shoot of Jesse, and the one who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. So here we have Paul proclaiming the gospel and quoting prophecies of what he believes to be the age in which he is living, the age in which the Messiah has come. And these passages that he quotes from Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah they foretell of a time when Gentiles are worshiping the God of Israel as Gentiles. For Paul, the fact that for Paul, the fact this was happening around him was evidence that the Messiah had come. Also, if Jews were to stop being Jews after placing their faith in Yeshua, it would seem like Hashem is no longer the God of Israel. And if Gentiles had to become Jews, it would seem like Hashem is God of Jews only. Check out Romans 3:29 through 31. It would not be the good news. A pillar of the good news is that Jews and Gentiles both have equal access in worshiping the God of Israel through Messiah Yeshua. And this is not only with the Jewish wing of the body of Messiah worshiping alongside the Christian church, but also on a local level. When we are all worshiping at gatherings with other believers, both Messianics and Christians, or at Messianic synagogues, or at Messiah conference, we're on a Zoom call together. We are all displaying to the world that the Messiah has come, and through Messiah Yeshua, we all stand before the God of Israel in united worship. So I hope this has been encouraging to you all. Thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, so whether you found this encouraging or you found this challenging, we'd love for you to join us over at Two Messianic Jews. If you feel like this was just a lot <laughs> and you need to listen to it again, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash two messianic Jews. So just subscribe there, hit the notification bell to get notified uh, whenever that's posted. And you can also find us on any major podcast player. Uh, and pretty much we hope that you join in this conversation with us. We want to hear from you. Uh, you know, there could be things that we've missed, other things we haven't thought about. 
Again, we just want to pursue truth with you guys. 